My name is Liza Bernard, and on behalf of the Dorman Williams Public Library, I welcome you all to this special evening celebrating uh, Rob Merman's publication of Circle of Sawdust. And I have to read this. It's a circus memoir of mud, myth, mirth, mayhem, and magic. It's the first time I've gotten it right. <laughs> For those of you not familiar, uh, Norman Williams was built in 1882. Three, and we are so fortunate to have this incredible space, and we appreciate your support, both your active participation, like showing out tonight on this gorgeous summer evening, and your generous donations. And I want to thank commu uh, Woodstock Community TV for recording this one, and many of our other talks. It'll be available later on their website and our website if you want to share it with friends or just review it yourself. And I also want to thank our co-hosts, Yankee Bookshop, who aren't here yet, um, but they will be here with Rob's book, and um, they generously donate a portion of proceeds of any sales that they do at our co-hosted events here at the library. So business out of the way. Um, when I learned of Rob Merman's new book, I knew we wanted to have him here in Woodstock, and I thought, who better to interview him than Rob Gruitt? And apparently a lot of other people have had the same idea. But um, Rob Gerwitz's background is as a writer, which includes stints at the Congressional Quarterly, among others, uh, where he focused on writing about change in communities. Along the way, he also wrote uh, Circus Mercus. He wrote about Circus Mercus in journals, and he wrote later worked on this uh, illustrated history in 12, so 12 years ago, 2012. And currently, we all know and love him because he is responsible for Daybreak, which is a local daily news newsletter emailed to your mailbox, and yes. <laughs> and if you don't know about it, just ask me, and we'll send you the link. Um, okay, that's Rob Gerwitt, and Rob Merman, otherwise known as Rob G and Rob M. Uh, Rob Merman ran off to join the circus in 1969, and after learning the ropes and circuses all over Europe and the former Soviet Union, he returned stateside, and in 1987, he, co he founded Circus Smirkus on a farm in Greensboro, Vermont. Circus Smirkus is America's premier touring youth circus, having initiated cultural exchanges in, with 32 countries, and it earned the title of the United Nations of the Youth Circus World. And I could go on about Rob's experiences and awards and accolades, but I'd rather hear it from him directly. So without further ado, the stage is yours. Uh, you'll hear from Rob directly in just a moment. <laughs> um, uh, so thank you all for coming. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, Rob and I go back a fair amount of time because uh, back in 1999, I got an, an assignment, a writing assignment, um, to write about Circus Smirkus. Um, and uh, I spent the summer, that summer, watching the show get put together uh, and then following the troupe around New England um, while Karen, my wife, stayed home with two little kids. And <laughs> it was, um, uh, I was a circus ignoramus when I started. I had been to a couple of Ringling shows. Um, I had actually seen um, part of... Uh, the Smirkus show the previous summer, but I knew nothing about circus when I showed up. Um, so it's pretty fair to say that when I arrived um, uh, to watch training at the old farm in Greensboro um, that Smirkus calls headquarters, I was off balance racing to catch up um, uh, and almost breathless with wonder. The reason was that I had stumbled on something that I think journalists often spend their entire careers hoping to find, which was an entire new world. Um, it wasn't just all those disciplines. It wasn't just juggling or acrobatics or tight wire or aerials, whatever, clowning, bareback riding uh, that summer. Um, each had their own techniques and demands and long histories, but it was also an entire new culture. Um, and uh, a way of looking at the world with traditions and senses of humor and very sharply etched personalities, um, all punctuated by this extreme devotion and, um, and just remarkable physical feats. That summer, there were four Russian coaches, one Mongolian, um, and an Italian coach named Alberto Zope. How old was Alberto then? I think 78, maybe? 78. He was no longer riding bareback, although if you watch The Greatest Show on Earth, right, yes. you will see him. Um, he was from a venerable Italian circus family, um, and he brought with him this, this flair and a deep understanding of showmanship um, and impeccable comedic timing. 
he, he did an act that I still think of as the thing that I've laughed hardest at in my entire life. Um, and then there were the kids who were 12 to 18 years old and who completely blew me away with their grace and strength and dedication most of the time. Um, and not surprisingly, I got really interested in the guy who had somehow pulled all of this together in an out-of-the-way corner of an out-of-the-way state. It was like, where did all this come from? We had long conversations about it that summer. We even wrote a book, as Liza referenced, uh, together that touched on it. But really, it's only now, 25 years later, that Rob Merman explains himself with this book, Circle of Sawdust. And so, Rob, my first question is, what the heck took you so long? <laughs> Hi, Rob. Hi. <laughs> I, I don't have an answer for that. You know, I'm still, still working on it. Uh, OK, I'll take that. So <laughs> let's go back. Um, and I'm going to ask you about, just to talk a little bit about um, the first two circuses that you uh, worked for in Europe. One was uh, the, um, the, <laughs> the ruffians known as the Hoffman brothers. The other was the elegant circus Beneweiss in Copenhagen. Um, and they were kind of polar opposites. So d describe them. Uh, yeah, well, let me put it in context. Uh, when I was 19, I decided to run off and see what the circus world was all about. So I stuck my thumb out in Europe, hitchhiking around, figure, figuring I'd bump into a circus somewhere, which, of course, I did. And the first circus that you mentioned here was Circus Hoffman build themselves as the wildest show on earth, which it was. Um, it was really a throwback to what I think of as American mud shows from the 1800s. Uh, everything was kind of out of control. And I explain that here. So if, if you want to find out what I'm talking about, you can read about it. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the Hoffmans. Because the next circus I bumped into uh, was Circus Beneweiss in Copenhagen. And if anybody has been to Copenhagen, uh, right opposite the Tivoli Gardens in the center of town, a block away, there's this beautiful 18th century built circular circus building that was built specifically to focus on the circus arts. And uh, in the first circus, the Hoffman Brothers, I got thrown into the ring, just like that. They said, what can you do? And I said, well, I, I'm a, I want to learn to be a clown. And they said, you're a clown? OK, put on your makeup. Let's see what you can do. <laughs> Same thing happened in Circus Beneweiss, but it was the polar opposite. It was very classy. It was uh, 2,000 cushioned seats facing one carpeted ring with a 16-piece orchestra in a balcony above the entrance to the ring. It was a permanent circus building. The seasons were seven, seven and a half months a year, seven days a week. And I was there for three years, kind of as a balance to the season I had with the Hoffman brothers. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I want to actually, I want to dig into Benavides a little bit more, but this seems like a good place to ask you, and there's a, there's a big difference in the way um, uh, people in the US and people in Europe view circus. Um, and not just circus itself, but everything that goes along with it. Clowning, animals, I mean, it, and so um, uh, it, you've had experiences of both. You, mm -hmm. There was a point when you uh, ran the Ringling Clown College later on. Um, describe you know, how you feel about those two things. What should we take away from that? The differences yeah. in attitudes towards circuses. Well, let me ask you a question. Okay. When you were a kid, did you get asked the question, what do you want to be when you grow up, Rob? Probably, but I don't remember it. I mean, everybody at one point gets asked that. What yeah. do you want to be when you grow up? I had no idea. You know, when you're nine years old, 10 years old, somebody asks you that question. You don't know who you are yet. You don't know what you can do. I 
when I was asked that question, I, I thought, I, I don't know. I haven't seen the world yet. Yeah. You know, I was a shy kid, um, and I decided that if I'm going to learn to be something, I need to go out and find out where I fit in the world. And I would rephrase the question now. I don't ask kids what they want to be when they grow up. It's more like my attitude when I was a kid was, well, what kind of person do I want to be when I'm an adult? Not what, what do I want to be, like an astronaut or you know, a veterinarian or a park ranger, but what kind of person do I want to be, no matter what I'm doing? Mm. And the one thing I did not want to do and had no interest in was running off to join the circus and becoming a clown. <laughs> I didn't like clowns. Kind of still don't too much. <laughs> clowns over here, to right. get yeah. to put yeah. this in context of your question. Uh, I had read, you know, in, uh, I remember Nat National Geographic, articles about traveling circus, traveling families, European families who've been in the circus for five, six generations, passing on the skills and the world view to their kids. And the kids working with their siblings and aunts and uncles and grandparents all traveling together. This was a totally different culture. And I wanted to learn about that. And the only thing I could figure was you know, I didn't have enough talent to be a juggler or a wire walker, but maybe if I could do a little clowning, run in the ring, and I'd be able to travel and learn what the circus culture was. Because the circus culture here in the States, uh, in this country, I think still, people always had the attitude that circus, circuses were sleazy, carnival operations, clowns were scary. They would wear fright wigs. Why do they call them fright wigs? Uh, and cir all circus circuses abuse their animals. Mm -hmm. And so I had no, I, no interest in becoming part of that world. But I wanted to find out what the European culture was. It's kind of like the American attitude towards soccer compared to the rest of the world. You know, we don't even hardly know what soccer is, but over the rest of the world, it's respected. Soccer players are heroes. And it was the same that I found out the circus culture in other parts of the world, clowns are respected as artists, beloved artists even. If you think of beloved artists Comedians, say, in our culture from you know, the 40s and 50s, Red Skelton, Danny Kaye, Bob Hope, Bing Crosby, that kind of thing. They're beloved. That's how older clowns were looked at in the European circus world, which is what I discovered. And so I never, I never worked in an American circus. It was always European and Scandinavian shows because it was, it's a totally different culture. Yeah, yeah. There were. Uh, you've got a great section in here where you describe the different kinds of clowns in European circuses, the white face. Um, uh, yeah, there's long tradition of uh, the white face clown, who uh, versus the Auguste clowns with the red nose and, and the big mouth that are always getting into trouble, and the white face clown is the authority figure. So there was this clash between the Auguste clowns and the authority figure, the, the white-faced clown. I learned, basically I was an apprentice in my mind to the Francescos. Uh, it was the Caroli family that had been in the circus for, I think there were eight generations, Italian clowns. And I worked with them for a couple seasons in, in Circus Benavice in Copenhagen. And Francesco was the white clown, and he would come out in this beautiful costume in a beautiful spangly robe and be playing a beautiful solo on the saxophone. And you just, ha. Ah. And just when he finished the solo in a spotlight, here come his two brothers, the August clowns, you know, with their instruments and making havoc, and their act would begin. 
but they were top notch musicians, uh, artists, and I learned from that kind of clowning. Not what we think of as circus clowning, the Ringling style, which is, you know, 20 clowns running around doing slapstick and knockabout and falling down, you know, kind of without any reason. Very different world view over there. Yeah. One of the things that always strikes me about, um, uh, you know, um, we use, we, in this country, we use circus as an epithet, um, you know, like that circus in Washington. And that's, we're not praising it. Um, and, uh, but one of the things that really struck me that summer I, I spent following Smirkus was how, um, how carefully thought through everything is. It is the opposite of chaos. Um, and these acts are, um, uh, you know, are, are trained and rehearsed um, for a really long time. So even if it appears to be chaos in the ring, it's not. And yet, every once in a while, something unexpected happens. All the time. All the, right, which you have to adjust to. So there's, there's, a, there's, like a, there's a wealth of stories in the book about um, things that happened during Benavides. But there's one I wanted to, um, to zero in on, which was the time you were doing um, a bank robbery act. Um, and you pulled, pulled out a rubber pistol. <laughs> and? <laughs> yeah, this was in Circus Benavides. I had two partners. One was an English fellow who was my age, uh, Peter Harrison, and uh, a, a dwarf-sized man named Antonio. And he was hiding in this bank, uh, a safe, bank safe, in the middle of the ring, hiding as 007. He had a hat that said 007, because the James Bond movie had just come out. So Peter and I were coming down the aisles. We were going to robbed the safe, you know, we tried everything we could, uh, tried blowing it up, trying to crank it open with, you know, these rubber things, nothing would work. I took out this very obviously fake rubber pistol and the gag was that Antonio would pop out of the safe, I would pretend to shoot and a silver bullet on an invisible string would come out in slow motion well, anyway, to get to the point of this thing is that one time I pulled out the pistol and I was about to shoot this little silver bullet on the string when chaos erupted in the audience. A whole section of the audience stood up. These guys in black with necks this thick came running down the aisle. One of them karate chopped my hand holding the gun. Uh, another grabbed my arms behind me and it, it was chaos. Little Antonio, bless his heart, went up and kicked one of the guys in the shins, and people thought it was part of the act. It turns out that uh, it was the recently exiled royal Greek family, the king and his family, who were visiting the circus. And this was a whole section of bodyguards around the king. And they thought I was, you know, pulling a pistol. So the show stopped for about 20 minutes, and there was apologies all around, and then we continued the show. The audience loved it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm going to move on a little bit. Um, in the book itself, you, you devote like a page to um, what happened in between uh, Hoffman and Benavise, which was you went off to uh, Paris to study mime with Marcel Marceau. Um, and uh, it, it I, I mean, as much as circus, it seems to me that helped shape your life too. Mime is a hugely important part of what you do, even now. Um, and uh, so would you tell us a little bit about that, even though it's not in the book? Uh, well, there is Marceau in the book. And Toward if we have end. time at the end, I could read what he said about Right. Being That'd in be the good. circus. Uh, yeah, Marceau became my uh, lifelong mentor and eventually friend for 35 years. And uh, he completely influenced my worldview of what it means to be an artist. Uh, and like watching his life, he became 
uh, the art of mime became known as Marcel Marceau, right, in our generation. And mime was his life. And the way that circus, circus is not just an art form where you do it and then you go home, you know, to your house or to a hotel room. You live it. You travel with it. And it becomes a world view. Marceau gave me a sense of how to move through the world. I mean, literally, you know, with technique, mime technique, how to move and how to observe the body. But metaphorically, he showed me how, how to live in the world, how to observe, how to observe yourself living in the world, if you know what I mean. How do you behave? How do you react to things? Um, and that's, I got more out of that, the metaphorical worldview from Marceau, than the literal technique. That's interesting. There's this moment um, uh, when you were um, thrown into the ring, in ben, or you were called into the ring in Benavice when one of the Bulgarian acrobats had an accident and they needed a clown to cover um, uh, for things. And, and, and it, it's, an, it's interesting because you fell back on your mime training, but, but you're very reflective in the book about the difference between mime and clowning. Each informs the other, but. Yeah, I do write about that in one of the chapters. Uh, one of the Bulgarian acrobats had hurt his knee in the ring, and suddenly the, the ringmaster is calling, clowns, clowns, you know, fill in. So I went running into the ring, no props, no partner, facing these 2,000 people in the spotlight. Uh, so I started doing a kind of Marceau act, which was an invisible tight wire. I set up this wire, invisible wire, and pretended to walk across the wire. But as I was doing this, I had a, an out-of-body experience where I saw myself from above the circus building looking down at me, the clown, doing this mime. And then suddenly I zoomed back into me, and I realized the mime was helping me entertain the audience, but as a clown character, I needed to relax the technique. The technique was a little bit too sharp. Uh, when you see mime performed in the Marceau style in the theater, you know, you, not street mimes who mimic people on the street. That's not mime. Uh, but Marceau, who is very dramatic on the stage, um, it's all about rhythm and technique and breathing. And also, he would say, learn the technique and then forget it. Let it go, if you've learned it well enough. So that's what I had to tell myself in the ring doing that improvised number. Ah, this, I know how to do this mime piece with the, with the rope. But now relax and let the audience see me through my clown character. You know, I'm not playing a character, I'm playing me, right. basically, in the European style of clowning. There's something that strikes me that um, Smirkus has had a, a, um, a, a number of really good clowns. And that summer of 1999, um, one of them, a guy named Ryan Combs, um, who went on to become a circus clown, um, was there. It was his first summer there. And I remember walking into um, uh, one of the empty tents, and Ryan was there by himself with a folding chair. And he was, he was opening it up and sticking his leg through one part of it and then like doing a somersault over it. And he was just, he was, he was 15, but he was playing with this prop trying to figure out, okay, what can I do that's funny? And you've got this great line in the book in which you write, to this day, whenever I enter a hardware store just for something normal, a light bulb, screwdriver, duct tape, the clown adrenaline kicks in. <laughs> so I was like, what is that? <laughs> yeah, what is that? Well, whenever you go to a hardware store to buy a prop, if you're a clown, you're not buying something uh, for what it's made for. You know, a screwdriver is for screwing screws. Well, a clown looks at a screwdriver and he, he, he's gonna use it for something totally different. And uh, 
it was always very humorous walking into the local hardware store because the guy knew me and he'd be looking at me picking up pipes here and ropes here and playing with this and see what fits into what. And he knows that I'm gonna do something that's out of whack. <laughs> so he doesn't even bother to ask. Sometimes he say, what are you up to now, Rob? You'll find out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, we, we were talking a little bit about the difference between uh, European and American circuses. Uh, with regards to sort of all sorts of stuff. One of the real differences, I think, is, um, uh, is the use of animal acts um, and uh, uh, the way animals are treated. Um, and uh, you can talk a little bit about that, but put it in the context of um, Kossmeyer and the unrideable, <laughs> and unrideable Kansas the mule. Yeah, there's a whole uh, 12 chapters in here about the Unrideable Mule Act that I was doing traveling through Sweden for seven months. Carl Kosmeyer and his Unrideable Mules. I'll throw in a little thing here. I do have a YouTube channel that shows that act. Oh. And it shows Ryan Combs doing Seriously? Mm. the Water Act. And it shows Rufus, the dog that I performed with for 15 years. So look up Rob Merman's YouTube channel and you'll see some cool. of the, those That's videos. Okay. And you'll see Carl Kosmeyer with the, with the mules. Yeah. yeah, a little bit of that. But to, to get to your point about animals, you know, I don't, we tend to more and more in the modern world get segregated from the animal kingdoms. You know, we, we, we could watch Discovery Channel and Nature Channel and learn a whole lot. But what about one-on-one -on -one connection with the animal kingdom? I found that in the circus, the top professional artists that I work with and the top animal trainers were so great at communication with the animals. They loved their animals uh, and the animals loved them. I would witness how uh, animals would, some animals would get excited standing in the animal tent, they would get excited like two acts before they were going to go on because they could hear the music and they knew that, oh, that music is two acts before our music. <laughs> you could almost see the horses talking to each other, getting excited, and, you know, the elephants talking to the horse and talking to the, to the, the mule. And going into the ring for them was like play, play time, recess. And can I describe the one Absolutely. Elephant Animal yeah. Act that uh, is a prime example for me, and I, I do write about it in the book. This was in Sweden. I was doing the, the comedy mule riding act, and when that was done, and I'd uh, comb down the mule and get him all set with his food, and I would go back and watch this act. A Hungarian uh, family of artists, they had horses, but here was one act where the guy came out in a gray tuxedo, riding a beautiful gray horse, leading a large gray elephant. So it was a human, a horse, and an elephant. They started just waltzing around the ring. The band was playing this beautiful waltz, very calm. And you're wondering, what's, what's going on? What's going to happen? The band got off the horse, left the ring. I mean, left, went through the curtain, disappeared. Suddenly, it was just a horse and an elephant. The horse started to lead the elephant around the ring in this beautiful waltz in time to the music. And you're watching this, and I think, How, what? And then at some cue, who knows why, uh, some communication between them, they switched roles and the elephant with his trunk took hold of the, the reins of the horse and started leading the horse around in the waltz in the opposite direction. And you're just mesmerized. The audience is silent. You know, you're, huh? Uh, no verbal cues, no human there. Finally, at the end of the act, the human comes out. Uh, the elephant bends down, lifts the human up onto its back. They waltz a little bit more. And they all sort of wave bye to the audience as they leave. You know, the, the horse nods. The elephant raises his trunk. The man just tips his hat. <laughs> 
beautiful. The communication, the bonding and communication that needed to be there between three animal species, you know, had to be through, through love. You know, as the animal trainers would say, uh, you know, we don't train the animals. We don't tame them. We find what they like to do, what their characters and personalities are like, and we encourage it and nourish it so we can communicate with them. They could communicate what they want to do to me. So again, a different world view about animals in the circus compared to here, where it's just, it's all media. It's, well, the circuses abuse animals, period. Huh? It would be um, interviewer malpractice for me not to invite you to talk a little about Rufus here. <laughs> so, I'm, I, you know, I've never actually, I don't think I know, how, how did you find him? Uh, Rufus, I found Rufus in a dog pound in Connecticut when I was visiting my mother. He was uh, just barely two months old. He had been found wandering in a parking lot. Uh, you know, when you go into a dog pound, it's just chaos and noise. The, you walk down in the cages on either side, dogs are barking and for sure some of those animals maybe were abused. And uh, I walk down and there's this little tiny puppy, you don't see puppies in the dog pound usually, sitting in the back of his cage. And I thought, well, that's probably abused. He's sitting back there scared. But as he saw me coming towards this cage, his ears lifted up like this. And when, he, when I stopped in front of his cage, he got up and walked to the front, stared at me. I thought, huh. So the communication began already. So I took him, and I'll have to explain <laughs> the act, part of the act that we did. Uh, he did mime this little dog. And that's on my YouTube channel, too. You can see Rufus doing a little bit of this, this act. Uh, Marceau met Rufus, appreciated what he did. I was working on, on an act once where I was in a restaurant, you know, just all in mime. I was eating a piece of cake. And, mm. and I was stuffing my mouth and apples and, and drinking and doing this whole bit. And Rufus, I never, I never taught him any tricks. I never trained him. He was just a natural actor. He's watching me, you know, eat this mime food. He comes walking over, and again, I never taught him to do this. Suddenly, he sat up. <laughs> I'm looking down, Rufus, what? So I took a, you know, invisible piece of food, went like this, and. He even swallowed it. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, I know. It is unbelievable. So you have to see it on the video. And uh, in Denmark, when I was still working in Denmark with Rufus, we were on this uh, weekly TV show. I was the mime. Rufus was the dog who did mime. And uh, there's a little bit, just a, a shot of him taking this invisible mime food and watch carefully, you could see him actually swallow it. I, I didn't train him. I think what was going on here, to refer back to the elephant and the horse and the man, was that there was silent communication going on here. He, I was throwing my intention to him, the intention of eating this food. You know, and you know, when you see mime, you start your imagination start to see things. You know, if I do this wall, you start, you can't help but start to see something there. So I think he was picking up my intention of this food. He could see the imagery that I was projecting and he was sending his intention that, I'm getting hungry, Rob, give me some of that. <laughs> so it was this silent communication through mime, the power of silence, the power of the art of mime which I think is a lot more powerful than we, than we give it. You know, how we project our thoughts and how those thoughts affect
the world around us and affect each other. So there you okay. go. There you go. We got off the subject of circus we very did. nicely. So I'm going <laughs> to yank it back to circus. Oh, OK. Sorry. <laughs> um, there's, uh, I keep referring back to 1999, but it was sort of my trial by fire learning about circus. There's an act um, in that show uh, performed by uh, a girl at the time, 15 years old, uh, named Rachel Schiffer, who uh, went on to become a, a wire walker in Europe and then now is the executive director of Circus Smirkus. Um, and um, Rachel did a cradle act. The cradle is a, it, it takes different forms, but basically it's, it's four metal bars put up high um, and there's uh, a, a, a catcher or a bass, um, a, usually a, a, a strong uh, performer who hangs upside down from his or her knees um, with their feet tucked under one bar and their knees over the other. Um, and then the flyer, Rachel in this case, uh, uh, sort of does tricks and often will dive off the bar, get caught by the catcher. But it's, it's, it, I, I never watched that happen without my jaw dropping or watching the audience sort of the sharp intakes of breath. Um, every once in a while, Rachel would stand on the bar, jump, if I remember right, backwards, and get caught by her catcher, who was a Russian uh, acrobat and, and flyer named Oleg. Um, and um, it, it was breathtaking, but from time to time, they would miss. Rachel was hooked in with what's called a lunge, and so she was safe, but um, she would get caught by the lunge and then climb back up over Oleg and then stand on the bar again and do it again. And when she did it and they, they, it worked, Oleg caught her and she swung and did stuff, the tent erupted. It was really, it was like you watch somebody fail and then you watch somebody succeed. And the emotional height of that, or the emotional weight of that is, is heightened. Um, and at those moments, it always felt to me as though the audience and the performers were kind of one organism. And it was like this otherworldly experience. Um, and uh, and I, I, I'm curious about how, you know, Smirkus could do that a lot, um, and we'll get We've got a few minutes. We'll get into the founding of Smirkus in a minute. But, but I mean, was that something you strived for or something you noticed um, in that, that sort of alchemy between the, the audience and the performers? Uh, that's, that's the magic that happens, as we say in the business, under canvas in a circus tent. You walk into a circus tent and you feel a different atmosphere already. Then you see something. Yeah, it's hot. It's, huh? It's hot. <laughs> it's, it could be hot. Hotter up there for yeah, Rachel. Sure, yeah. But that, that connection between circus performer and audience, one way to look at that is when I think of the difference between a theater performance on stage in a theater, uh, connecting with an audience for sure, but in a very different way. The actors are acting, they're not themselves, they're acting different roles. Circus people are completely themselves. That's Rachel up there about to jump backwards, this 15 year old kid, backwards in the air, hoping to be catched by this Russian. You know it's real, they know it's real. When he catches her and you know she's concentrating, then she jumps, as soon as she's caught, you see this smile on her face as she's being swung. It's like, I did it. And it's not to show off. That's another difference. Uh, we, we talk about this with the Smirkus kids. You're not showing off how good you are. Look what I can do, and you can't. It's, no, I've got this skill. I've been working on this, and I've got this trick. I want to share it with you, the audience. Yeah. Look what I just did. I can't believe it either. You know. <laughs> And she's swinging. So there's that, what Marceau called, the, that magnetic resonance between a performer and the audience. Marceau had that, for sure. 
he got our imaginations sitting in the audience. When you watch Marceau doing mime, when you watch the circus performer jumping through the air, your body feels it and your imagination is working hard, hoping they get it. And you don't realize how much your, your imaginations are working when you watch a live circus performance. It's exhilarating and afterwards you go home and you say, oh, whew, I'm exhausted, I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've got uh, about 20 minutes left. There's a bunch of stuff oh, that I haven't gotten to yet. But I, we also want to, before however many of you need to get to the village meeting, um, uh, we wanted to open it up to questions and answers. <clears throat> so, uh, have at it. Yeah, Cirque du Soleil. Before you answer, um, did, were people able to hear that question? Yeah, question about Cirque du Soleil and how, how different is that? And how, you know, a lot of the Smirkus kids, when they graduate from Smirkus, a lot of them have gone to Cirque du Soleil and become stars. Yeah. Cirque du Soleil has changed the attitude of circus somewhat in, in the world. Unfortunately, in my mind, they've become now so big, they have companies performing everywhere around the world, several Cirque du Soleil different shows in Las Vegas and all over the place. The skill level is fabulous. The production level is out of this world, but very different from what I was teaching the Smirkus kids to be direct with the audience. Um, Cirque du Soleil is all production. In fact, one of, one of the Smirkus kids who ended up as, as a star for five years, uh, Karen, uh, said to me during rehearsals at Cirque du Soleil, you could get fined if you smile. You know, because they have very strict choreography, very strict methods makeup that they're giving, uh, costumes that are very wild. They're not who you are, it's who Cirque du Soleil image is. So I totally appreciate who they are, what they've done, and the skills are amazing. So that encourages me even more to, to have the Smirkus experience be the opposite, to balance the huge production with the more personal. Yeah, it's not unusual to to hear a Smirkus alum who went on into the circus world later say it was never as good mm. as in Smirkus itself. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So what was your family's reaction when you ran away? <laughs> <laughs> well, my mom, I said, Mom, I, I want to run off and find out about the circus world in Europe, you know, and maybe be, become a clown and perform. She looked at me and, you know, in a Yiddish kind of voice said, circus, smirkus, go get a real job in a bank. <laughs> so circus, smirkus, I took the H out and it became circus, smirkus. <laughs> but, but later on, you know, when I was bringing kids over from Russia and Mongolia and China and Latvia and all over the place, they would arrive at Kennedy Airport. Uh, we would pick them up in a bus, drive to my mother's house in Connecticut. All these kids who didn't speak any English would be sleeping on the floor all over her house. She'd be making pancakes and blintzes the next morning. She loved it and they loved her. She became the circus mama. 
So, circus schmirkus. <laughs> Circus Smirkus in Greensboro. I'm from Greensboro. There are, there's not very many accommodations there. There's no stores <laughs> there. There are no restaurants there except Highland Lodge. There's Willie's. Yeah, there's Willie's, but why Greensboro? I needed space <laughs> to do something that had not been done before. I had no idea how I was going to do it. I would have been totally overwhelmed in a city. Uh, so I sat there with my dog Rufus on the porch of this old farmhouse, thinking, what do I do now? But I got the town folk behind me, because uh, I started working with the farm kids, you know, teaching them to juggle and stuff like that. And it slowly grew from there. And uh, yeah, you know, Vermont and Greensboro really did well by me, so I, I, I hope I'm able to give it back to the town now with, you know, Smirkus headquarters is there and the, there's a facility now with, for beginning circus camps and things like that. Well, it has changed since I've lived there because now you have the brewery, Hills Farmstead, yeah. you have Jasper Cheese, and you have Highland Theater of the Arts. And Circus Smirkus was the first. And it was the first. Well, maybe you brought it all in. Could be. <laughs> yeah. This is an astonishing book. Mm -hmm. It just, I cannot tell you how I grab people and say, you have to read this. It is filled with wonderful stories. It's very intimate in certain ways and revealing. And you become very vulnerable telling these stories. It's a very generous, great hearted moving account of your experience. Now it's here. It's in the world. What's that like for you, having put this in the world? Thank you for those. Well, you know, it's a little bit like putting uh, Circus Smirkus out there in the world. You know, I don't have children of my own, but as people say, I have thousands of kids that I've worked with. Um, this is like another little child, but I, I wanted to tell my story, not debate or argue the questions of animal cruelty in the circus, yes or no? You know, sleazy or not? I just wanted to tell my experience, my story, and put it out there. But having written this, you know, the themes that come out of the book for me that I see are what we've talked about today. Uh, the difference in attitude and worldview about circuses, about mime, about animals. Uh, and it encourages me to write the next book, yes. which hopefully, you know, what I do telling my experiences in the circus world, the best of the circus world, really, despite the Hoffman Brothers' wildest show on earth. Uh, I want to do the same, if I, if I have time, to write about the art of mime and experiences with Marceau and his teacher, a man named Etienne de, de Creux that I also worked with. And because people have no idea of the art of mime anymore. Kids have no idea of the name Marcel Marceau you know, and in the 20th century, there were two great mimes. In the first half of the 20th century was Charlie Chaplin, his image known around the world through film. Second half of the 20th century was Marcel Marceau, his image, that white face, known around the world, not through film, but because he traveled the world for 60 years performing nonstop. So thank you for those words, uh, kind words. Appreciate that. There's yeah, some back. over there, too. Oh, wait, sorry. We'll go over here. Um, I don't love mime, and I was curious about what you were doing. <laughs> the bolt that you said was a bit of a mime, and you say you combined it with a clowning. I just wonder if you could just tell us a bit of how did that look? Mime? Uh, that'll be for the next talk. <laughs> <laughs>
No, really. Um, that's a huge subject. Thank you for asking about that. Uh, I could go on and on about that, but. We'll, we'll, we'll wait for the next book and then. Yeah, I'll be back. We'll reconvene <laughs> and we'll talk about that in the back there. Yeah. No audition. Uh, well, that's the story. It's a good story. You should tell it. OK. I, write, I do write about that in the book, too, uh, where I was in college out in Illinois, Lake Forest College, and I saw an announcement that Marceau was performing. This was 1969, performing, I think, up in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, Show begins at 8 o'clock. It was the middle of the winter. I borrowed a friend's car. I had to drive a couple hours to get to the theater. Arrived at the theater, quarter to 8, ran to the box office. Sold out. Closed. But when you're 19, you know, you don't just <laughs> say shucks. <laughs> so I walked around the building, the snow and the sleet's coming down, and there it was an alleyway. I opened a door that walked through another alleyway and closed office buildings. And there's another door, opened that door, walked in, you know, pushing these winter coats. I was in some closet. The light went on. A man said, you here to help? Ah, mm -hmm. uh, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> he said, well, quick, grab those chairs, these folding chairs. Because uh, we're putting these chairs up in the back of the theater because Marceau's show is sold out and we want the staff to see it. I said, that's why I'm here, sir. Picks up some chairs, set them up, sat right down. <laughs> I picked up a program and in the back of the program it said, Marceau Marceau uh, is opening a mime school in October, October 3rd, at 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. at the Théâtre de la Musique in Paris. So, huh. So I wrote a letter to the, who I figured was his agent listed in the book, the program, asking how do I apply. I got back a form letter, one page form letter. Looking at this, it says exactly that, that October 3rd, 10 a.m., Théâtre de la Musique, blah, blah, blah. But nothing, nothing more, no. So I showed it to my dad, showed this letter. I said, Dad, what does this mean? It doesn't say anything about an audition or, in those days, you know, there's no computers. You couldn't send him a video or anything. He looked at me, my dad, bless his heart. He said, hmm, well, you'll never know unless you go and find out. <laughs> my dad, so I, I showed up at the Théâtre de la Musique. Uh, his, Marceau's brother, his older brother, was standing there with a list. I told him my name. He said, uh, yes, come on in. <laughs> you know, whoever applied got in. At that point, you know, there was, there was not a huge, I think there may be 30 of us from around the world. So you never know. You know, I tell students, I tell my teenage students, they say, well, you can't do that kind of thing these days, Rob. You can't just run off and show up at the circus. You can't. How are you going to get a job? You have to send a resume, photos, videos, this and that. I said, yes, you could do all that. But why don't you just show up and see what happens? I said, yeah, you still can do it if you have a different mindset. You, know, don't, you don't have to do everything the way you're supposed to. If somebody tells you this is how you're supposed to do something, I mean the word supposed, supposed to, <laughs> run the other direction, do it your way. So that's, that's how I started with Marceau and Marceau changed my life and uh, you know, on and on and on. Can I read? A, read whatever you want. I gotta, I gotta read for you. It, I tried to put my story, my personal story, in the context of circus history. So people would not think, well, this, this is just modern. This is what happens. 
to rob, you know, in, in the 20th century. But the same kinds of things that were happening to me were happening all over the place. And I looked up a lot of, I did a lot of research, especially in Vermont newspapers. So every chapter opens with an epigram, a short little quote, from a newspaper like in the 1800s to show that, you know, some things haven't changed as far as attitudes towards circus. Here's one from uh, the Burlington Free Press and Times in Vermont, July 27th, 1883. Quote, it is with circus going as it is with sin. <laughs> One sin is followed always by a long procession of others. He who goes to the circus is lost forever. That's <laughs> fair to say, wouldn't you think? <laughs> yeah, you know, here's, here's another one. Uh, the Vermont Phoenix, Brattleboro, eight, 1859. Quote, no one will pretend that circuses are schools of morality. But to be amused and astonished must be worth something hygienically. Will we learn nothing from this? I don't, I don't know what that means either. <laughs> <laughs> hygienically. Oh, the Herald and Globe, Rutland, Vermont, July 26, 1883. There were two, lot, oh, and this is about the circus parade through town, not even the show, but the parade of animals and performers to get to the circus site. There were two lively runaways yesterday morning, but no great damage was done. One of the elephants in the procession ran against a street gas lamp and somewhat demoralized it. <laughs> <laughs> You're a writer. You must appreciate this, Rob. <laughs> I, I envy that. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. I mean, the language. July 4th. Uh, this was from Ringling Root Books. Th these were the daily journals that someone on the Ringling Show kept about where they were, the population of the town, because they would travel every day to a new town. Uh, the, what the weather was like, any events that happened, what ticket sales, you know, all that. Here's a root book from, uh, in Wisconsin, July 4th, 1891. Big top sideshow and horse tents flagged in extravagant style. At night, grand spread eagle fireworks. Big bonfires built and a century's worth of pyrotechnics fired, whose constant sheaves of golden rain kept up a quiet flirtation with the stars. <laughs> like who was writing that for Ringling? <laughs> yeah, some PR guy or yeah. knew what he was doing. Ah, but then the Farmer's Herald, St. Johnsbury, Vermont, 1831, this is getting early. Quote, the circus saw fit to come parading into our quiet little village on the last Sabbath. Legislative enactments are needed to guard the community against these baleful influences. <laughs> oh, and I do write at that chapter about the Vermont legislature of 1836 introduced a law that stipulated all circus riding, theatrical exhibitions, Juggling or sleight of hand, ventriloquism and magic acts shall be and are declared to be common and public nuisances and offenses against this state. Transgressors were fined 200 bucks. That was a lot. So that was going on and on. However, finally, Governor Richard Snelling in 1991 issued a proclamation, quote, to wipe out any lingering remnant of Vermont as an anti-circus state. Excellent. <laughs> it is, on that note, time for us to close. There are books, and Rob will be here to talk to anybody who wants to talk to him. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rob.